Thanks. Good morning and welcome to Universe, Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Lake County. I'm delighted to see you all this morning. Uh, and many of us are getting some much needed rain. So we're hearing the thunder and booming out there. I'm Janine Reagan and I will be your service leader today. <clears throat> Just a little reminder <clears throat> on our uh, tech tips. <clears throat> You have two viewing options for the service, speaker view with highlights, the person speaking and gallery view, which shows you everyone who is on the link today. You will find the options in the uh, word view, which is uh, somewhere on the, um, usually on the edge of your screen. Most often it's up in the, the right-hand corner. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us this morning. And I will begin with a few announcements. Our service is being recorded except for joys and concerns. You will find this service in several of our earlier services on our YouTube, YouTube channel, UUCLC Office, which you can also access from our weekly bulletin and from our website, lakecountyuu.net. The chat box <clears throat> on Zoom is open. You may take some time at this point early in the service to enter a joy or a concern which is too tender to speak aloud, and it will be read during that part of the service. You may also enter a donation into the funding link, which is also in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Today, immediately after our service, we will hold our annual meeting in which we will vote on our board, new board members and our budget for the year. <clears throat> While only members can vote, everyone is invited to attend the meeting. Does anyone else have an announcement today? If so, please raise your hand and someone will call on you. Christy Cleveland has an announcement. Christy? Yes, I just want to um, let people know that on Earth Day, which is April 22nd, it's a Thursday, uh, we are going to be having a film available for you to view called The Condor and the Eagle about um, environmental impact on indigenous people, as well as all of us. And it will actually be available for 24 hours from noon on Wednesday, the day before, until noon on Thursday. And then we'll have a discussion at three o'clock that you can join. So there will be information on the website and you'll get an email eventually letting you know that you, how to sign up if you wanna see that and be part of the discussion. Thank you, Chrissy. Anybody else? Jane Hefton. Uh, yes, I hope everyone is aware of the social justice lecture this evening on protecting and enjoying our waterways. We have four wonderful environmental advocates uh, on the panel to speak and um, if you're wondering where the link is to join the online presentation, uh, it's in our service bulletin. So thank you. Christina Wilkins. Yes, good morning. Uh, just wanted to let everyone know that on Monday evening, April 19th at 7.30 in the evening, we're going to have uh, an opportunity to discuss and answer questions about our opportunity to go solar at our building. And we will be sending out the link uh, later this week. And we invite everyone to join and hear all about it. It's a very exciting opportunity for us. Thank you. Any other announcements? <clears throat> I don't see any other hands, Janine. Okay. Thank you, Henry. Welcome to all. If you are a first time visitor or perhaps returning after an absence, if you are comfortable doing so, I invite you to wave your hand at the camera uh, so all can see you. And a member of our tech team will call on you. <clears throat> and you can unmute and introduce yourself and tell us what brought you here today. Do we have any visitors? Robin Day. Robin, would you like to, un there you go. <laughs> yeah, hi, I'm new to Eustis uh, area and um, this is actually my second time. Thank you so much. 
Welcome, Robin. We're glad you came back. Anyone else? I don't see anyone. If you are interested in receiving our monthly newsletter or weekly bulletin or having someone from our membership committee contact you or learning more about Unitarian Universalism and our community here at UUCLC, please send us an email at office at lakecountyuu.net or leave your email in the chat so we can contact you. Today, we welcome back Dan Gribben. After 37 year career as a prof uh, professor of English, as well as American and African American literature at Perrin College in Virginia, Dan Gribben retired to Florida to enjoy the Florida outdoors and to write and perform folk music. <clears throat> he is also an accomplished photographer of Florida wildlife. Many of us have purchased his beautiful note cards uh, made from his photos, and we'll see a couple of his photos today as well. <clears throat> Dan and his wife, Martha, live in Daytona Beach Shores and are members of the UU Congregation of Ormond Beach. At that place, he uh, serves on the uh, coach as co-chair of the worship committee as well. <clears throat> Dan? Yeah. Um, we have our uh, opening reading here from uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, his book called Nature. To the attentive eye, each moment of the year has its own beauty. And in the same field, it beholds every hour a picture which was never seen before and which shall never be seen again. <clears throat> the light of the sun does not lift the shadows that have fallen on humanity and the world over. We relight our chalice flame to reignite a spirit of radical optimism, knowing it takes all living, <clears throat> excuse me, knowing that it takes us all living what matters to dispel those who divide us. All manner of things will be well if we make them well. May our free religious community embody the right relationships that our world so desperately needs. Now we can enjoy Dan's song. Spirit of Life. Oh, Spirit of Life. Kristen, are you screen sharing? Sunday, we make time for those who wish to offer a joy, a concern, or a sorrow, or to set an intention for the coming days. This portion of our service will not be recorded. The concerns that we have heard, we will now take a moment for silent reflection. Make yourself comfortable, take a couple of slow, deep breaths, and enjoy the calming music. Thank you. 
please join me in reaffirming who we are by reciting together our congregational covenant found on the screen. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. Jane Hepting will now share some of her thoughts about what UUCLC means to her and the importance of pledging. Jane? Good morning, everyone. I have uh, only been a member of this congregation for about two years, uh, mm -hmm. but I have found a home here and I'm grateful to all of you for making me feel welcome. I love this congregation for many reasons. Uh, I will name just a few. Um, first, I love our congregational covenant. There is no higher aspiration than dwelling together in peace. Uh, we do that through seeking the truth in love and helping one another. Second, I love the fact that we welcome everyone regardless of whether we believe in God or in an afterlife, regardless of uh, who we love. Third, I love the commitment of this congregation to protecting our environment. I don't know of any other religious organization in Lake County that is willing to advocate for our environment even in the face of such dire predictions. I read three uh, sad facts in the daily commercial just two days ago. We usually have six hurricanes per year, eight are, predicting, or eight are predicted for this year. South Florida trucks its sewage sludge up north into the headwaters of the St. Johns River. Uh, despite the inactivity during COVID, our CO2 levels increased in 2020. Our planet is in trouble and needs our congregation to keep speaking out. Finally, I am so proud of the commitment to social justice. In the last two years, we have hosted a candlelight vigil when immigrant children were placed in cages, we marched into Barry's to protest bringing a statute of a Confederate general to Lake County. We mailed postcards and uh, delivered flyers urging people of color to vote. Most recently, we waved signs at a rally in Lady Lake to protest the voter suppression bill and the anti-protest bill. We host discussion groups to combat racism. We donate money and food and personal products to people in need. We write letters to the editors. We make phone calls. We send emails to our legislators. Since last summer, we hosted 12 social justice lectures online. We care and we speak out. We need to shine our beacon as bright as possible to convince other faith organizations to do the same. To con continue our good work, of course, we need money. In preparing my remarks today, I looked into my own heart and decided to increase my pledge by 20% starting May 1st. So I ask you to please pledge something every week or month. Uh, if you're already pledging, please considering increasing the amount. Even a little more will help. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. <clears throat> it is our practice to give generously to our church as we are able and keeping in mind both its meaning in our lives and its impact in the world. We are thankful to all who provide financial support for UUCLC. In order to continue our virtual services and keep our beautiful building protected and ready for our eventual return, we ask for whatever financial support you can provide. There are multiple ways to do this, which are found on the slide in the Sunday Service Bulletin or our UUCLC website. 
You can also de donate from the link in the chat box right here today now. Thank you for your donations. I feel that spirit running through It runs through me, it runs through you And when I breathe that ocean air I know that spirit's everywhere It's everywhere I see a dolphin in the waves He wants to know how much I gave To make his world a better place For dolphin kind and the human race The human race I see a girl I used to know And in her eyes I see that glow And I'm reminded once again How wide our circle can extend It can extend That spirit running through It runs through me, it runs through you And when I breathe that ocean air I know that spirit's everywhere It's everywhere We know it's love that brings us through A loving gesture rings so true And when we lend a helping hand Our love will flow throughout the land Throughout the land Feel that spirit running through It runs through me, it runs through you And when I breathe that ocean air I know that spirit's everywhere It's everywhere It's everywhere It's everywhere I feel that spirit running through It runs through me, it runs through you And when I breathe that ocean air I know that spirit's everywhere it's everywhere I see a dolphin in the waves He wants to know how much I gave To make his world a better place For dolphin kind and the human race the human race I see a girl I used to know And in her eyes I see that glow And I'm reminded once again How wide our circle can extend it can extend I feel 
that spirit running through. It runs through me, it runs through you. And when I breathe that ocean air, I know that spirit's everywhere. It's everywhere. We know it's love that brings us through. A loving gesture rings so true. And when we lend a helping hand, our love will flow throughout the land, throughout the land. You're on, Dan. Thank you. <clears throat> it's great to be with you, and I bring greetings from uh, our UU Ormond group. Uh, many of you know how much the folk group over in Eustis uh, nurtured my talent and brought me along uh, the Eustis Street Grill and the Women's Club, where your group used to meet, were all very important to me and, and all those wonderful people. and. It's been a pleasure to share music with you all and to speak to you occasionally. Um, today, the topic is nature and the American spirit. And for someone like myself, who spends a great deal of time in the presence of our natural Florida environment, it's difficult to know where to begin to talk about the American spirit in relation to nature. I thought about simply talking about birds but then Poe's raven appeared on my shoulder to whisper, nevermore. So I've settled upon the idea of sharing some examples of the effect of nature on several writers besides Poe, who've had considerable influence in shaping the American spirit. In 1923, which is the year when my parents were born, the Macmillan Company published in New York a volume of literary criticism entitled Nature in American Literature. Uh, the author was Norman Forster, and the subtitle he chose for this volume, I'll try to show it to you here, uh, it's a little blue book. His subtitle is Studies in the Modern View of Nature. Now that might seem to be a curious subtitle for a 1923 volume that spends seven of its nine chapters discussing the importance of nature in the works of writers who wrote and died in the 19th century. But Mr. Forster's subtitle was clearly designed to point toward his discussion of John Muir and John Burroughs, who are the subjects of the final two chapters in the volume. John Muir in particular set the tone for our attitude toward nature in the 20th century. Many of you will recognize him as the man who almost single-handedly saw to it that America has preserved at least a small percentage of her wilderness areas in our system of nat national parks. But those first seven chapters of nature in American literature are devoted to writers, most or all of whom will be familiar to you. William Cullen Bryant, John Greenleaf Whittier, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, James Russell Lowell, Walt Whitman, and Sidney Lanier. Now the intervening 98 years have not been particularly kind to the reputation of Whittier, Lowell, and Lanier, but I would not for a moment fault Mr. Forster for including them. Today, we're gonna to take a brief look at the contribution to the American spirit offered by the other four writers, Bryant, Emerson, Thoreau, and Whitman. While recommending the works of John Muir and John Burroughs as wonderful examples of the kind of observation of nature that feeds enlightened thinking. As a professor of American literature, I was always happy to introduce my students to William Cullen Bryant. 
He was a youthful prodigy as a poet, an influential newspaper editor in his mature years, and a man who spent a good deal of time in the wooded hills of Western Massachusetts. Bryant shared his reverence for nature in poetry that was couched in echoes of the King James Bible. Not until Walt Whitman burst upon the scene in 1855 would America have a poet who spoke in plain English about matters of serious moral and spiritual concern and about nature. But Bryant's solemn tones seemed somehow perfect to convey his sense that nature speaks to us of a benevolent deity who has seen to every detail in creating this magnificent land. In one beautiful stanza of his poem, To a Waterfowl, Bryant describes the incredible staying power of the migratory bird. He says, all day thy wings have fanned at that far height, the cold, thin atmosphere, yet stoop not weary to the welcome land, though the dark night is near. Bryant's faith in the working of a higher power is conveyed in this stanza. There is a power whose care teaches thy way along that pathless coast, the desert and illimitable air, lone wandering but not lost. And of course there he's referring to that migratory bird. Bryant concludes the poem with a ringing endorsement of the idea that we too are natural creatures under the care of a benevolent power. Addressing the bird, he states, he who from zone to zone guides through the boundless sky thy certain flight, in the long way that I must tread alone, will lead my steps aright. We turn next to a poet and essayist who probably agreed with most of what Bryant wrote, but who took great pains to distance himself from an overly biblical notion of a higher power. Ralph Waldo Emerson's impact as a shaper of the American spirit is very familiar to Unitarian Universalists. His father was a Unitarian minister, and for a time Ralph Waldo himself seemed destined to follow in his father's footsteps. Ultimately, however, he resigned his ministry on the grounds that Christian thinking was simply too confining. Emerson was sufficiently clear about the importance of nature in our lives that he entitled his first book simply Nature. Published in 1836, the book calls for a break with the past, a new and original way of thinking about spiritual possibilities for Americans. Why should not we also enjoy an original relation to the universe, says Emerson? Why should not we have a poetry and philosophy of insight, not of tradition? And a religion by revelation to us and not the history of theirs. Now, where are we to look if not to the Bible for spiritual inspiration, spiritual guidance, spiritual renewal? Not to the dusty bones of the past, says Emerson, but to nature. Emerson took Emanuel Swedenborg's ideas seriously enough to profess that the doctrine of correspondences between nature and spirit was the key to our understanding of the human condition. Emerson calls upon us to look to nature for lessons concerning spiritual growth, even contending that every natural fact as a corresponding spiritual equivalent. Some might say that's cutting it too fine, but Emerson is clearly paddling down the right stream when he contends that we Americans best learn to understand our spiritual selves and to develop our spiritual potential by studying and responding to our natural surroundings. He was the most popular orator of his time, and this was his basic message that the spirit of life that flows through nature flows through man, and that we can awaken to that spirit by heeding the promptings of nature. Emerson did not purport to be a systematic philosopher, but passages like the following one that appears early in his book, Nature, helped to establish him as an American sage. He writes, 
The lover of nature is he whose inward and outward senses are still truly adjusted to each other, who has retained the spirit of infancy, even into the era of manhood. In the presence of nature, a wild delight runs through the man in spite of real sorrows. In the woods is perpetual youth. In the woods, we return to reason and faith. There, I feel that nothing can befall me in life, no disgrace, no calamity, which nature cannot repair. Standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or parcel of God. As I'm sure all of you are aware, Henry David Thoreau was considered to be a disciple of Ralph Waldo Emerson, enthusiastically following his teachings about looking to nature for spiritual truth. Actually, their relationship was a complicated one, but one sure fact about Emerson's influence is that Thoreau's reading was guided by the older man. And that reading included a great deal of material from the sacred books of the Hindu religion. Thoreau's idea of simplifying his life might well have been instilled by that reading. And the direction that this simplification took involved an emphasis, emphasis on the basics supplied by nature. When Thoreau moved to the banks of Walden Pond and built a small cabin on land owned by Emerson, he did so with the intention of continuing to devote time to his reading, continuing to write daily in his journal, a habit instilled by Emerson, and continuing to work on a book that he had begun in honor of his beloved brother, who had died unexpectedly after the two of them had completed a canoe trip on the Concord and Merrimack rivers. I mention this because there may be a tendency for people to think of Thoreau as turning to nature out of disgust for mankind, like Gulliver rejecting the yahoos, and of isolating himself like a hermit. That was simply not the case. Indeed, Henry dropped by his mother's kitchen quite often for his meals before trekking back to the cabin at night. And he wrote, all honest pilgrims who came out to the woods for freedom's sake are real and really left the village behind, I was ready to greet. Thoreau's emphasis on studying nature was a natural product of his interest in Emerson's ideas and those that he encountered in his reading. He was a good scientist who took seriously the task of recording his observations and measurements. If Thoreau took the idea of observing nature to something of an extreme, it was a matter of circumstance as well. He and his brother intended to open a school and in fact, they had done so before his brother's death. That undertaking was more than one man could handle. So Henry took a step back and dropped out for a while after his brother's death, steeping himself in nature. The leavening value of nature to us all might be demonstrated by the following passage in Walden. Not till we are lost. In other words, not till we have lost the world. Do we begin to find ourselves? and realize where we are and the infinite extent of our relations. In a somewhat spicier passage, he wrote, we need the tonic of wildness. Thoreau's particular emphasis, indeed the single greatest contribution that he made to our notion of the importance of nature to the American spirit might be said to be in the matter of suiting the means to the ends. He was not at all impressed with the busyness of those around him. He once remarked that the telephone line between Maine and Texas might be quite a scientific marvel, but what if Maine had little to say to Texas? In the same vein, he wondered if the physical labor required
Ed's magnum opus, Walden, or Life in the Woods, is full of observations of that sort. Observations that challenge our notion of the relationship between the individual and society. It is also full of Emersonian interpretations and speculations about natural facts, such as this one concerning the way the wind plays upon the surface of the pond. A field of water betrays the spirit that is in the air. It is continually receiving new life and motion from above. We shall perhaps look down thus on the surface of air at length and mark where a still subtler spirit sweeps over it. One idea that Thoreau might well have drawn from Oriental philosophy, the idea of being fully awake, will demonstrate how he works with a concept to give it solid grounding at the same time that he explores its philosophical dimensions. Living close to nature, in other words, with fewer distractions imposed by social obligations, gave Thoreau the leisure to operate by nature's clock rather than the fragmented notion of time imposed by the railroad's timetable and the business of the world. He shares this idea with us concerning his daily wake-up call. It is true I never assisted the sun materially in his rising, but doubt not it was the last importance only to be present at it. In another passage, he says, every morning was a cheerful invitation to make my life of equal simplicity, and I might say innocence, with nature herself. And in another passage, let us spend one day as deliberately as nature and not be thrown off the track by every nutshell and mosquito's wing that falls on the rails. As I mentioned earlier, Thoreau's greatest contribution may be in encouraging us to suit the means to the ends. Could we benefit from his example regarding the natural rhythms of the day? Are the means that we are using to rouse ourselves and to be on time for our appointments somehow symptomatic of a misemphasis in our lives? Could we find better means to pursue ends that we deem more important than those that are dominating our schedule at present? These are the kinds of questions that Thoreau's experience in nature led him to ask. And it is in this sense that Thoreau offers us guidance about the ways in which nature can influence spirit. I'll bid adieu to Thoreau here with the passage that I've always recommended to readers to memorize, his justification for his sojourn in nature. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. We conclude with the formidable Walt Whitman. Like Thoreau, Whitman was a special case, but a very different case indeed. Whitman was an urban man steeped in the busy cultural scene of New York City in the mid 19th century. He was a man so embroiled in the partisan politics of his day that his managing editor asked him to step down from his editorial position with the Brooklyn Eagle in order to cool down a bit. Whitman was in his thirties at that time. He took a long trip down river to New Orleans, returning to his native Long Island, a changed man, determined to become America's poet. Indeed, he might well have heard Emerson deliver his lecture entitled The Poet, for Whitman once said, Emerson brought my simmering to a boil. Whitman returned to Long Island to live with his parents, to take care of his developmentally challenged brother, and to do carpentry work to earn his daily bread. That ancestral home where he took up residence was within a stone's throw of the seashore. And when Whitman, like Thoreau, began to give himself time to respond to the rhythms of nature, it was the sea that spoke to him, spoke volumes. His poem of awakening to the call of literature through the call of nature is entitled Out of the Cradle, Endlessly Rocking, a title that refers to the sea in its endless motion. 
Whitman was so completely attuned to the fullness of nature, the cycles of nature, that he has the sea whispering one word to the child in the poem, and that word is death. The child has experienced vicariously a mockingbird's loss of its mate. And in the dynamics of the poem, Whitman arranges for the child to respond to the song of the surviving bird and to understand intuitively the idea of loss through the song and to turn to the sea to understand more fully how his own awakening longings might relate to that song. In the opening stanza of another poem, one which eventually took the title Song of Myself, Whitman refers to his desire to observe nature at nature's own pace. He writes, I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. Now the volume in which this poem appeared is entitled Leaves of Grass. The very pages on which the poet writes are fabricated from trees, of course. And so is the content of the poems an organic product. Whitman is a visceral poet who gets inside his subject in a way that constitutes a radical identification with the human body as a natural object, something we would search hard to find in the works of his predecessors. Loaf with me on the grass, he says. Loose the stop from your throat. Not words, not music or rhyme I want not custom or lectures, not even the best. Only the lull I like, the hum of your valved voice. Notice here that the poet is speaking in the language of everyday discourse, involving us even more intimately in the dialogue with nature. I will conclude with lines from the final stanza of Song of Myself, where Whitman's speaker in the poem identifies himself essentially as the spirit of America. He writes, the spotted hawk swoops and accuses me. He complains of my gab and my loitering. I too am not a bit tamed. I too am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yawp over the roofs of the world. Now I think Walt Whitman would agree that you've gotta be a little crazy to identify so strongly with nature. Thank goodness we've had these crazy revolutionary voices to point the way toward preserving and enjoying nature in America. For the spirit of America is certainly to be found there. Good to be with you this morning. Florida's child will race the wind, she'll laugh if you try to chase, and then she'll lose you among the cypress knees, bowing to great applause from the towering trees. Florida's child has rainbow eyes for tracing her colors on the skies. A merry-go-round of clouds will whirl She lies on the grass and grins As they twirl and twirl Florida's child regards the tides As rhythm to do her dancing by As gulls glide high above the strand she coaxes a dragonfly with her outstretched hand. Florida's child regales the moon by weaving her beams along the dunes as leatherback hatchlings cross the sand. She watches them trade the land. And see. Florida's child will race the wind, she'll laugh if you try to chase, and then 
She'll lose you among the cypress knees, bowing to great applause from the towering trees. The world is too beautiful to be praised by only one voice. May you have the courage to sing your part. The world is too broken to be healed by only one set of hands. May you have the courage to use your gifts. May you go in peace, Eric Williams. Now join us uh, as we play our song, Weave. <clears throat> you may want to place your screen in gallery view so that you can join in a kind of weaving of hands as we listen. Kristen, do we have weave up? Thank you. 